Welcome to the Just Barbarian Things podcast. This week, we are going to be setting up your character for the Eberron fireside story, so our little Eberron story arc. That's true. That's what we're doing. And uh, if you're a patron on patreon.com slash Things, then you are hearing this before the official start of that story. Um, for everyone else, you're not hearing this until after the end of the story, so hopefully this gives you a little insight into the character you've already been hearing about in our episodes so far. Welcome to the party, pal. All right. So just to get started, we're going to talk a little bit about Eberron and kind of set the stage. So in Dungeons and Dragons, obviously there are a lot of different versions of kind of the world that that takes place in. And right now in the current edition in fifth edition, that default world is the Forgotten Realms. And so that's what a lot of people are familiar with. Waterdeep, Neverwinter, Triss Jordan, all that fun stuff. Eberron is an alternate realm that the game can take place in. And recently they released the fifth edition materials for Eberron. And from what I understand, you are not that familiar with Eberron, right, Heretic? That's true. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson and we're going to go from there. I'm into it. I'd like to learn about the history of Eberron. I have some interesting materials in front of me. Um, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun with that or whatever, (laughs) but I have some pretty cool looking maps and whatnot. And I think there's two kinds of people in the world. Um, People who enjoy maps at the beginning of their fantasy novels and people who abhor them. And I I guess maybe there's a third type of person, people who kind of like both. And I like both. I love uh, Terry Pratchett where he's like, you can't map an imagination, but I also love the maps of like Tolkien and stuff like that. So um, seeing these maps is, uh, is really cool and pretty exciting for me. Well, it's just a visual aid and you can look at as much or as little as you want. We're obviously not doing a giant campaign in this world right now. It's just a little fireside story. Uh, So we're going to be focusing on one little spot in Eberron, but I think it's helpful to see the world and kind of understand what we're dealing with. So Eberron in in the, the fiction is a world that exists in a place where multiple planes of existence overlap with each other. And sometimes because of the way they overlap, some of them are accessible and kind of bleed over into the other ones. And Eberron's kind of right in the middle of all that. So Eberron is the planet. So on your far left of your visuals, that's what you're going to see there. And as you can see, Eberron has multiple large island continents on it. We're going to be focusing on the continent of Corvair, which as you can also see, isn't even the largest one. It's just the one where most of the story for Eberron takes place. Now, Of that, we're going to be focusing on the region of Breland. So if you look at your second map, that's actually the continent of Corvair. And you can see kind of middle left, I want to say, is Breland. And on Breland is the city of Sharn. So your game is going to take place pretty much completely in the city of Sharn. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some basics of Eberron in general. Um, because the feel of it is going to be a little bit different than standard Forgotten Realms. So Eberron is a world where magic is, exists. It's still fantasy. Um, but what makes it a little bit different is that the arcane is treated more like a science. So magic is harnessed in the creation of technology. Mundane magic, like cantrips and rituals and things like that, you can encounter on the city streets. Performers will use magic. Um, You can go to kind of guilds and things like that to get certain spells cast, like if you need basic healing and things like that. Okay. But higher level magic is very rare and like true wizards are not very common and things like that. This sounds kind of Rothfusian, if I can (laughs) coin a term. It sounds very... Uh, Name of the Wind, uh, King Killer Chronicles sort of uh, um, inspired, although this probably came first. So it would uh, be fair to say that uh, 
Patrick may have drawn some inspiration from this sort of setting. He is a big D and D nerd, so it's right. definitely possible. So it's it's, it's possible, yeah. that Kvothe exists in <laughs> a world um, somewhat inspired by Eberron because they sound very similar in, in your description of the culture. So some things that your character will be used to having dealt, like lived in Corvair all their life um, would be kind of the magical technology that exists in the five kingdoms so or in the five nations. So like the lightning rail, which is the magic train, mm-hmm. elemental airships, everbright lanterns, so which are like the lamps that are in city streets, but because they're magical, they can like work the way our modern street lamps do. Mm. So they don't have to be lit. Interesting. Um, okay. Speaking stones. Mm-hmm. AKA cell phones. Right. Um, and obviously the technology that created the Warforged. Yes. All of those are kind of normal, everyday magical technologies that you would be familiar with. One of my favorites, by the way, Warforged. <laughs> Love the Warforged. When, when Eberron was announced and subsequently came out, I was, I was so happy. <laughs> oh my God, you guys. <laughs> you do love Warforged. Oh, they're fantastic. The other way that magic is a normal part of society that you would be familiar with um, that is different than Forgotten Realms is going to be the idea of dragon marks. Hmm. So dragon marks are something that is genetic. It's inherited. So there are bloodlines that carry dragon marks. And dragon marks are literal marks on the body. And there's different ones for the different types of marks, um, which give the person who bears them special abilities huh and so you can't be a dragon marked warforged then because you inherit it from your bloodline and warforged are forged so right although it is possible like we could build it into the background that the way in which you created caused an aberrant dragon mark because those are things as well there are definitely bloodlines so they're the major houses in Eberron that kind of control each major dragon mark because that's like their bloodlines dragon mark. And so you go to those houses to get services related to the kind of abilities that are associated with that dragon mark. And is that the only nobility? No. So each nation kind of has its own upper class and the way they work and everything. But right now, and we'll talk about the treaty a little bit more Part of the treaty that ended the last war has given all of the major nations a common set of laws and things like that. Okay, and it's important to uh, point out here, I think, that when you say the last war, you don't mean the most recent one. You mean the war that's commonly referred to as like the capital, last capital war capital. Like, yes. That's its name. That's its name. Okay. Just because that's an important distinction in the lore, I think. Right. Beyond that, um, I would say Eberron is considered to be much more pulp than typical Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the idea that the locations, especially between the different regions that are in Corvair, are much more exotic compared to each other. Um, the stakes are a little bit higher because um, I feel like verticality comes into play a lot more and speed and things like that in Eberron than it does in Forgotten Realms where everything's either on foot or on horse. Heroes are remarkable people. Not everyone is a hero in Eberron, but Eberron needs heroes desperately because of the times that it's in. And it's a little what they call neo-noir, which is the idea that it's not as clear cut who's a hero and who's a villain. There's a lot of shades of gray. There's a lot of intrigue um, because everyone's still kind of recovering from these long lasting rivalries at best hatreds at worst because of the war now when you say that um speed is a factor um it's not necessarily character movement speed but more the speed with which you can travel around the continent because of airships and trains and stuff well i would say consider like speed is a fact there are rules in Eberron for falling out of city towers and falling off of lightning trains and airships and stuff like that, where you don't have to think about those things very much in typical D&D. Okay. The, that's true because 
need to mark my that's true counter. <laughs> if if you fall off of a speeding train, it's very different from falling off of like a cliff or whatever. The, the physics involved are different, right? So they have rules for that. Right. Spe- uh, specific, specifically, putting the emphasis, the wrong syllable. <laughs> okay. Um, that's That's pretty in depth. Going back to our little introduction to Eberron, now we can talk about the war. So Eberron in this edition has just emerged from a war that was going on for more than a century, and they call it the Last War. So it was basically a civil war that occurred after the death of a leader who had united kind of the area for a long time. Um, And the continent is definitely changed by that war, especially since it just recently ended with the treaty. So most established characters would have been involved in the war in some way. Now, the thing that ended the war was um, an event called the Morning, like M-O-U-R-N, not like Good morning. Yeah, sure. So veils and black ties and whatnot and less sunrises and birds tweeting right. and stuff. Nobody officially knows exactly what the morning was or what caused it, really. Basically, there was this giant explosion that pretty much left the nation of Seer, like on your map, you can see it's that white one in the middle mm-hmm. that says the Mornlands. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it pretty much left um, the Sire area in a state of ruin. Um, Some say that it was the result of a cataclysm of using war magic for too long. Some say it was some horrible technology gone wrong. But basically, it's like a nuclear bomb went off in that area. Um, And so there are a ton of refugees from that region and that that kind of scar is now the Mornlands. <laughs> that was a pretty cool format. I was saying, you know, some say this, some say that. All we know is it's called the Mornland and it's a wasteland. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a deadly wasteland in the heart of Corvair because you can see it's right in the middle there. Mm-hmm. Now, that area is of interest to a lot of different factions because figuring out what happened there, figuring out what remnants of magical things might remain that sort of thing is definitely a component of things going on in the world but also outside of that in general eberron is a land where there are ancient mysteries and things to uncover um there are pro- like draconic prophecies and all sorts of fun stuff to get into you'd think that there would be like um you know university indiana jones type of people and all sorts of other just folks who would be researching what caused the morning and so on uh who spent time in there to try and you know figure that out and do research and so on and so forth i mean is that a thing that is a thing but we can't talk about it in past tense because remember this literally just happened okay so yes that is happening people are trying to figure it out but basically the cataclysm that is the morning led to the signing of the treaty. The Treaty of Thronehold was signed after the morning as a way to end the war and prevent further catastrophes from occurring. Under that treaty, certain nations were recognized and others were left out, which continues to cause conflict in a general way. So the Treaty of Thronehold includes a lot of different nations. You can kind of see various nation like regions outlined on the map. But the main five are and have always been Ondere, Breland, that's where Sharn is, Sire, which is now the Mornland, Karnath, and Thrain. And those are kind of the five in the middle of that continent. Mm-hmm. Between those nations, those specific five, are where you're going to find all the good roads, all of the um, train lines, all of the airship lines, because those are like the main civilized areas, or at least in the case of the Mornlands, were the main civilized areas. Going outside of those five, even if they're recognized nations, it's a little bit less supported by infrastructure. 
a little more wild west, so to speak. Right, exactly. Cool. So you're probably not going to be able to hire a coach to go to those outer areas. You might have to sign on with a caravan or something like that. Or go yourself or whatever, but you're, there's or not like a, a service that just, will necessarily yeah, take you. Go by yourself if you're a hardcore badass like that. Right. <laughs> like, dang. So where our adventure is going to take place is the city of Sharn. And Sharn is the largest metropolis on the continent. Sharn is special in that as it grew... It kind of ran out of room to spread out because of the like natural geography in the area. And so it was forced to build up to expand. And so unlike most cities, like when we talk about Waterdeep and we talk about Neverwinter in Forgotten Realms, where they're kind of divided into quarters or like major sections, Sharn is divided into quarters and plateaus. But then each of those is divided into layers. So you have upper, middle, and lower for all of the major quarters. Um, and as a general rule, and this should kind of make sense, upper class folk live in the upper levels. Middle class folk live in the middle levels. Lower class folk live in the lower levels. And then below that, below the city, there is a kind of rough and tumble place called the Cogs. And that's where the City Watch doesn't tend to go. And you do have that cutaway map that kind of gives you the basics of how that works. Interesting. All right. So as we start to make characters, we're going to do it the normal way. We're going to roll, well, determine your race, determine your class and all of that. But as part of kind of the neo-noir, intriguey, Eberron character creation process, we're also going to do some extra rolling or extra choosing to kind of establish your character's debts and regrets and kind of the more grittier parts of their character. Man, that sounds awesome. So, any questions on Eberron before we get started? No, I don't have any questions about uh, Eberron. It looks really cool and I'm looking forward to learning a lot about it because I feel like I've just barely scratched the surface and man, I am in. It looks so awesome. All right. So again, it gives us a little bit of a different, because you're so familiar with Dungeons and Dragons at this point. For those of you listening, I know you're familiar with our podcast where we do fireside stories and a lot of them have been in horror games and things like that. Um, for our friend group at home games, we play primarily Dungeons and Dragons. So we have, both of us have a good amount of experience with it, especially fifth edition. So I wanted to do something a little bit different, especially since the Eberron content was out, especially since you love Warforged and have for the last two editions. So much. Um, not to say that you necessarily need to play one, but it's that world that they're from and you've never really gotten to dig into it. That's true. And we'll see, <laughs> um, you know, maybe the dice will favor uh, my proclivities and give me Warforged. Maybe they won't. Who knows? That's the fun. I will say for when I've been making my weekly random characters, again, something our patrons get to see every week. Um, I Because we're doing Eberron-specific characters, I would re-roll every once in a while if I got an option that was like not very Eberron-feeling. Um, so you do have an option, as always, of rolling a few times until you get something that feels right if you're going to do a random roll. Yeah, I'm going to definitely do a random roll. Spoiler alert. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. What I'd like you to do, if you haven't already, is open your D&D Beyond link for our campaign that I started. And we're going to start building your character from there. Donzo Berenzen. Donzo Berenzen. Um, And you should... Okay, so you already have your kind of character thing come up. So the options we're going to choose... Um, we're going to turn off homebrew content because I don't have any in there that you need to worry about right now. Turning off homebrew content. You can enable playtest content. Playtest content enabled. And by default, Eberron should be enabled, but make sure it is. Eberron content enabled. Um, for advancement type, go ahead and put XP because we will use XP for this game. Confirmed. And you can leave the rest as is. So no the worries. rest as is. 
<laughs> All right, and then go ahead and hit next over on the right. Okay, I can put I can rename this guy at any time, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I gave him a name as depends on race hyphen class. <laughs> Not hyphen um apostrophe. Okay. So his name right now is depends on race class. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Right, is this little blue button next? It is. Yes. Okay. All right. So now that's just the race list. As you can see, one of the printouts I've given you today is my patented rando roll race list. And because you often complain about it, it is double-sided printed. I wouldn't say I often complain about it. I would say I complain about it every time it's not. Okay, so yeah, often. often. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, good. I'm glad you're able to unscrew yourself and start saving paper. It just takes extra walks back and forth. Well, that's good. Because we no. don't have a duplexing printer. Not yet. If you'd like us to have a duplexing <laughs> printer, please join us on patreon.com slash just barbarian things. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't keep it in. That was funny. All right. So the first few pages are just pictures and basic descriptions of all the available races, including the, the uh, playtest races. So the unearthed arcana races like centaurs and shit. Okay. Um, the rando rolls are, yeah, there. So, um, this looks like a D100. It is a D100, which you are familiar with from Call of Cthulhu. And what if you roll a 100? Doesn't it say? It goes 97 through 99 is Yuan T. Oh, I used to have a 100 line that said roll again. <laughs> oh. But I think that one got cut off when I expanded it. Let's. Let's uh, hand write it in here. 100. Roll. Again. Nerd. Okay. All right. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm going to roll, and then I'm going to look up what it is. Sure. And I'm going to use my bone dice. Oh, man. Now, these are chess X in the color ivory. And don't let the name put you off. They're plastic. Twenty-eight. All right. Let's see. What is my race? If it's listed alphabetically, I'm guessing it's not Warforged. It's not Warforged. <laughs> <laughs> but that is okay. All right. Do 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 do. Furbolg. <laughs> Twenty-eight to thirty is Furbolg. Yep. So, um, how you does know. that lend itself to? Uh, to Eberron and, and whatnot. Well, what one of the rules say? of Eberron is anything that's in Dungeons and Dragons is an Eberron. Just might not be where you expect it. Um, Furbolgs, by definition, um, tend to be kind of wilderness dwelling people. Um, they are very much like I would say the stereotypical Furbolg is the stereotypical druid type. Um, that being said, you could certainly have one that has traveled, that has, um, because of the war, the last war, maybe it has sought refuge, um, maybe where they lived was destroyed. So I would say they're certainly, they exist in Eberron, but they wouldn't be one of the main races you typically see in Eberron. Okay. I mean, I'm happy to keep it if you think it'll work. I have to rely on your expertise for this sort of call. And for the record, just now when I saw Furbolg, I was conflating Furbolg and Bugbear. So um, I, I actually think a that's confusing. a common issue. Yeah. Oh, I'm not alone in that? No. Oh, wow. Okay. So Furbolgs, depending on the lore that you like to go with, are either um, kind of descendant of like giant types or like if you're a critical role fan, they're a little bit more of like a kind of cow elf like thing, um, but definitely like nature people. Yeah, man, I'm into it. If you think it'll work, I'll keep it for sure. I don't it need can to work. It. I would say that the main point of your background would be for us to give a reason why a Furbolg is now in the biggest city in the continent. What's a Furbolg like you doing in a big city like this? Exactly. Um, I would say, if you want, maybe give three roles and then choose the one that feels the best to you, because there are a lot of races to choose from, including sub-races. I will say that Furbolg, by default, does not have a dragon-marked subclass or sub-race. I mean, that's all right. I don't yeah. need to be dragon-marked. Just... 
it is an interesting aspect. Okay, we'll do three rolls and then go from there. 91. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, boys and girls. 91. Uh-oh. What could it be? What could it be? Oh. So close. <laughs> so close. Uh, so Warforged is a different number in the vicinity. Right. Uh, 91 through 93 is Triton. Again, another one that wouldn't be super common in Eberron. Um, they live in the deep ocean. Uh, Triton have, I would say in 5th edition in general, the way that they're depicted as becoming more involved and more aware of surface happenings. So they're starting to become more common on the surface, uh, but they would still be a novelty. I would say something that would be unique about a Triton is potentially they would have had no involvement in the last war because they're not part of the regions that were involved in it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it looks like this planet has a pretty giant ocean and has lots of oceans. Like it seems like it maybe even has less landmass than earth. So that, uh, it makes sense that there would be vast undiscovered depths of ocean floor. Right. So I would say like, if you're going to relate Triton's, to kind of uh, mythology that you're familiar with, I would think about them like Wakanda. Okay. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where they have not really been involved in the goings on of the other nations until more recently. So by choice, then. Right. Mm, they're isolationists. Right, exactly. Okay. All right. This is the final roll, kids. Final roll right here. 87. So that is in the wrong direction for Warforged. So <laughs> That's true. Warforged is not in the cards here. And you can um, always choose okay. to play a Warforged, though. No, I, you know, I, I chose to rando roll. I'm going to stick with it because I think that just gives you the opportunity to play something you otherwise would never play. Okay. It gives you the opportunity to play a race class combination you might not otherwise have thought of. It really sets the stage for a flawed character, a weird character, a derpy character. And those are just so much more interesting and more fun than something you build like to accomplish a purpose. And then right. you just end up pressing one, two, three over and over again. And it's just boring. So I am definitely in on this rando stuff. So 87 is tiefling and that's probably gonna be our winner i'm just gonna go on <laughs> record right there so tiefling has a number of sub races so i will need you to do that secondary role to figure out what type of tiefling you would likely be okay well that's a 1d10 yes so it is i'm gonna use a different because i use my bone dice uh for this so i'm gonna switch to something let's here we go galaxy here we go. Seven, Levistus. Um, so Levistus tieflings, as you probably are aware, tieflings are kind of demon-touched characters. Right, yeah. Um, Levistus tieflings come from um, the frozen Stygia, and um, they are kind of bound or come from an archdevil that is known for offering bargains to those who have no better, like basically no other way to get out of it. It's either doom or take the deal. Um, they are known for being charismatic and hardy, and they have icy type spells at their disposal. So they get Ray of Frost, Armor of Agathus, and Darkness as their legacy spells. Man, listen. <laughs> if If it wasn't like locked in as soon as i hit tiefling <laughs> that just i mean that strikes five and six right there oh man from like being bound to like a frozen plane of hell is just so perfect with my personal like whatevers that <laughs> you know that that hell isn't hot 
you know, hell is cold and hell is isolation and separation from the divine and all that kind of stuff. So it just really meshes with that. So this like demon touched creature that has a very cold flavor to it is, is so far up my alley. (laughs) Like it's around the corner. All right. So you will notice in D and D beyond, if you click on tiefling, you will actually have the option to then click on Levistus tiefling to choose it as your specific sub race. Tiefling. Levistus. Okay. Now, it gives me a pop-up for some information about them and stuff like that. A lot of what's on your printout, so I'm already familiar with it, thanks to your fantastic duplexed printout. (laughs) Yeah, it gives you some information because you can change your mind. But if you want to choose it, go ahead and click the green Choose Race button. So it it wants me to uh, pick a bunch of... Nope, it's just giving you information. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So age isn't like a drop down where you pick an age. It's just saying how they age. Okay, I get it right. now. I didn't scroll. Sorry about that. Um, one thing that it does say in this description. Yes. It says to be greeted with stares and whispers, to suffer violence and insult on the street, to see mistrust and fear in every eye. This is the lot of the tiefling. Yes. Does this hold true in Eberron? So what I would say for many races is like, well, the things that are de- typical in Forgotten Realms are not typical, blah, blah, blah. The problem is one of the main issues that Eberron has had in its past is the issue of demons um, flooding out into the world and causing problems. So yes, being a demon-touched character would probably cause you some issues in your life. Hell yeah. Okay, that's actually awesome too. That is fantastic. Okay, so just for folks who are maybe in traffic or whatever who aren't following along on on D&D Beyond or aren't already familiar, is it okay if I read their racial traits here? Yeah, that's fine. So their racial traits um, are plus two charisma, plus one intelligence, dark vision, hellish resistance, and Infernal Legacy. So that's uh, pretty awesome. There's a link here to the LaVista's Tiefling Details page, which I won't get into right now. Yep. And then just kind of a sentence that's uh, Frozen Stygia is ruled by LaVistus, an archdevil known for offering bargains to those who face an inescapable doom. Yep. And so that would be your 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 patronage basically comes from this creature. Oh man, see this is why you rando roll, but also why you temper it with like a three piece. Right. You know, because that just lets the magic happen. Because I don't think I would ever, ever, if I was making a character, have picked something like this. And this is already looking so awesome and amazing. <laughs> so And it already gives us a little bit of an idea of kind of the interactions your character has probably had in their life. Because what we are going to be creating for you, because we're doing a tier three game is a character that is already very established in the world. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit of what we're going to be doing today is kind of playing through different times in your character's life um, to give an idea of how you've become established in this world. So definitely your race is going to paint a lot of how people have interacted with you generally Mm -hmm. and the opportunities that you've had and things like that. Yeah. Um, Just to give you some background, I know you already know how dark vision works. You can see in the dark. Um, Hellish resistance gives you resistance to fire damage. Interesting. And infernal legacy gives you the thermotergy cantrip. And at third level, you get hellish rebuke. Um, So there's those things. Wow. But um, your infernal legacy changes it uh, because specifically you're Levistus. So that's what changes. So instead of thermotergy, you get ray of frost. Instead of hellish rebuke, you get armor of agathis. And then you still get darkness as your third spell. Okay, yeah, no hellish rebuke. That makes sense. Yeah, familiar with that from my warlock. Right. So, um, but he's like kind of an ice guy, so not having hellish rebuke kind of makes sense. I wondered how they were going to handle that once I heard hellish. Okay, very cool, very cool, very cool. So, but yeah, so that's going to be kind of how that works. So back to your stuff from 
the race page, once that loads in, you're going to see it kind of gives you a rundown again of what those special abilities are. There's no choices here because they're all assigned as part of your race. Mm -hmm. So you can just hit that blue next button on the right side okay. next to your little portrait. Done. And the next thing will be class. Do you want to rando roll your class? Of course I do. Right. Classes are a D12. Oh. Just so you know. Okay. Can I take this opportunity to apologize to everyone for my atrocious English accent, both as Carl Law <laughs> and just any time ever, just this blanket. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm not good at it. I try and I don't mean it as a caricature or a lampoon. It's imitation being the sincerest form of flattery. I just, I know I'm terrible at it, but you know, I keep trying to do it anyways. So I'm sorry if it's, if it's horrible and polluting your ears. Okay. Class. Is D12. Yes. So since there are fewer choices, do you still want to do three piece? Do you want to do two piece? Or do you want to leave it to a single roll? Um, you know, I would say let's do a single roll. And if it's just horrible, switch to three piece. But that's really no different from three piece. So why don't <laughs> we just do three piece? That's fine. Okay. It's, it's like rando roll light. Right. You can go rando roll hardcore where both of them are one. But really think the three piece lets the magic happen so i'm a believer as far as that's concerned so here goes one d12 two I believe that's the bard uh, let's see here two is indeed a bard okay and since i used one two three for my race i'm going to use abc for the class so right. i have kind of a jackson five since you're doing a three piece here. are you going to roll your subclass as part of your three piece or are you going to wait until you choose no i'll roll the subclass okay that is a 1d6 and the sub rolls are always galaxy dice dice are important in serious <laughs> business okay don't look at me like that i can feel your look one <laughs> all right and no that's a barbarian uh glamour okay a glamour bard. A glamour bard. Hmm. You so, know, not a bad fit for a tiefling, if I'm honest. Um, yeah. I mean, it's um, glamour refers to like the fae. So you would be someone who is either was trapped in a fae plane at some point, or has studied the fae plane, or has an instructor familiar with fae magic. Yeah, I mean, I can already see a backstory kind of coalescing in the midst of my imagination for this sort of character with a, a Levistus tiefling, you know, making that pact way in their past to escape some horrible fate, you know, and then kind of trying not to think about it as they go about their life. And then they're a tiefling in this big city where they're horribly ostracized, but they're just like, they just do not care because they're just super happy and they're just going to be a fucking rock star 24 7 and do their thing and nothing's gonna stop them sister like th that's <laughs> that's the kind of character that starts to sort of emerge when i see that so we'll, we'll see what happens though. okay okay back to 1d12 the bone dice five what do we got what do we got what do we got what do we got fighter of course okay the tiefling fighters are pretty cool. Well, especially with all of the subclasses involved in fighters, it can get very interesting. Subclass for fighter. What do we got? Six. Roman numerals. I don't know which one is damn stupid. Eldritch Knight. Okay. Okay. So um, an Eldritch Knight is going to be a fighter who can also utilize spells hmm. so eldritch knights use magical techniques that allow them to cross over a bit with wizards um they usually focus on abjuration and evocation um for protection and damage hmm. okay so that's kind of how they work here we go boys and girls roll number three this one's for all the marbles all the dice in the dice bag 10 all right what do we have here sorcerer 
It's a good one. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. So you may ro roll your subclass. And much like my third roll for race, I think the third roll for class is going to be the winner. It's not as set in stone, <laughs> but for a plus two charisma, plus one intelligence, I think that's just like a really good fit. So, oh man, <laughs> look at this. Look at this. If I roll a five, it's wild magic. This my is my favorite. I, yeah. I'm, I'm looking ahead. I shouldn't look ahead at the table <laughs> and then roll. I should roll and then see what it is. Yeah. So I've kind of unwrapped the present. I've had dessert first. That's not cool, but yeah, I'm grown. Don't judge me. Mm -hmm. One. <laughs> okay. Divine soul. Tell me about divine soul, Ringo. Uh, divine soul is actually a really cool one. So, you know how sorcerers have a natural font of magic? It's not learned. They didn't go to school for it or anything like that. Yeah, it's not Maybelline. You're born with it. So a divine soul, and this could be a good source of inner turmoil for the character, gets their sorceress origins from a divine source within them. They get their what from a divine source? Their, their sorceress powers. Okay, okay. The From source it. of their sorcery yes. is a divine shard, if you will, in a their glimmer. DNA. Yes. So it could be um, part of your ancestry. It could be um, a deity that favors you. Um, there are a lot of things here. And so obviously, if your character was a divine soul sorcerer, there would be a lot of conflict internally slash externally between Levistus, who kind of owns you, and this divine source that is trying to save you. Okay, so unlike or perhaps like the warlock, um, with the tieflings, what's it called? Um, infernal legacy. Yes. Okay. Like your pact with a warlock, how similar is it to that? So not very, honestly. Um, tieflings usually are the result of something that happened in a family past. So it would be a parent who made a deal, a grandparent, something like that. And then now you are the twisted offspring because of a union that occurred. Okay. It could be more direct than that, but that is definitely less common. Okay. So you don't necessarily enter into this yourself. You're kind of subject to it, and that's that's okay. Right. Um, I guess I mean in, the, in terms of from the otherworldly patron or whatever right. perspective. Um, I would think of it more like inherited – as far as like that is what you have naturally because of your demonic heritage. So that makes sense. What I'm trying to understand is the relationship between the two. Like with the warlock, you're just a pawn in their game usually. You're a tool that they're picking up and you can be discarded when you're no longer useful. Right. Um this seems to suggest an ongoing relationship across generations that um, implies sort of a uh, two-way beneficial symbiotic kind of relationship that um, might have more of a you know, uh, caring, fostering, husbanded sort of relationship, a kinder, gentler you know, denizen of the underworld, <laughs> like if that makes sense. Well, I mean, here, let's, we'll get into the official meat of it. Cause obviously we can kind of twist this in almost any way for the sake of a game because fun trumps rules, but tieflings are derived primarily from human bloodlines with some sort of reason where infernal heritage has left an imprint on them. So this can be, you know, and especially in Eberron, it could be one of the unfortunate outcomes of war, which is non-consensual creation of new creatures. Mm -hmm. um, it could be because of, and especially in the case of Levistus, a pact that was made where one of the parts of the deal 
was offspring. Okay. So kind of a like, if I save you from whatever Lord so-and-so, your house will serve me. Right. Until your bloodline is extinguished. Yeah, it could certainly be something like that. And then you tried to negotiate and Lephistus was like, no, forever. <laughs> okay. Right. Something like that. Right. And so one of the reasons that people don't treat you well, one is because obviously you look like a demon, which isn't helpful. Um, but two is because they know that somewhere in your family history, something was done, you know, like with involving demons. And so it's kind of you're not trusted because of that. Okay. So basically, to answer my question in a nutshell, the chances of you having a constructive, healthy, loving relationship with your infernal patron are basically nil. It's not likely. It's not like that. At all. I mean, it could yeah. be, but it's not likely. We, we could make it that way, whatever, but for, for the most part, generally, that's not how it works. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean they aren't aware of you. They could be watching you. They could be looking to use you in some way, especially as you develop. Um, but you probably don't have an ongoing yay, relationship with them over time. So it's the juxtaposition between, you know, an infernal patron and like a deity where, you know, you're you're like, um, you know, yay, Bahamut, he's awesome, or she, I mean, um, <laughs> and, and they love me and, and stuff like that. And then to a certain extent, that's like, that's true. You like serve them and please them and like you have like – righteousness and goodness and joy in your heart. And they're like, those things please me and I love you. You know, whereas this is more of like a, a darker, more like insidious sort of situation where you have no choice. You're basically a slave um, or a tool in their toolbox or in their arsenal. Um, and, and that's it. And or so I mean, best case scenario, you never hear from them at all. Or any of their minions, but you just have to deal with the aftermath of being that way. Oh, okay. So that could be a thing too. Right. You don't necessarily have a spawn clown goading you down a path. Right. You just you have to deal with, like you said, the fallout right. of a, a pact that your ancestors made. Right. Ooh, that's awesome. Okay. That that's a lot of meat to to cut into <laughs> okay. and to make into a deliciously tasty character sausage all right so our options are glamour bard which is a lot of kind of twisting emotions and perceptions using your bardiness which is so tempting um you have um kind of picking up on the natural spell casting ability that your character innately would have um honing that through study to become a martial wizard basically right which is Less tempting, but I mean, if I was stuck with it, like if this is a single role and that's what I got, I, I could make that work. Yeah, it, it is a good subclass. And then the final one being um, a sorcerer who derives their ability to cast spells from some sort of divine favor or history. Which is just super amazing and awesome. And just having a, a character with an inborn conflict like that is just uh, perfect it makes my pants tight that's just great <laughs> it's so great all right so are you going with that then yes okay because this is up to me this is a choice that i can make and i'm definitely choosing that because that is fantastic all right so i would note oh obviously you already have it written down at level one you don't get to choose well actually do you choose your origin i don't think you do at level one but let me double check sorcerer's origin uh, bah, 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 bah. Oh, you do do it at first level. Cool. You said doo-doo. Doo-doo. So choose sorcerer as your class. And then when you choose it, you're going to notice that um, instead of just showing you the breakdown, it's going to give you two that have options in them. Mm -hmm. And have you choose your origin first. Origin. That's the bottom one. And choose divine soul. Divine soul. Done. Okay. Because that's going to open up more options. It now. does. Okay. 
it's almost like you know what you're doing to an absurd degree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now's the part where we start thinking about your character. Okay. So we know that you're a tiefling mm -hmm. whose patronage comes from this icy archdevil. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's probably going to influence the way you look a lot. Yes. You're probably not going to be a red tiefling. No. Um, just saying. Mm -hmm. All right. But we're starting to think about that. You've discovered probably X-Men style at some point in your puberty that you can innately cast spells. Okay, yeah. Now's the time to figure out exactly what that's starting to look like. So you'll notice in your divine magic choice, it kind of gives you some flavors to choose from. Because the thing about a divine source is they're not always good. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. And it lists affinities that look like alignments, but these are just affinities. So the affinities are going to give you a flavor of the type of spells that you'll get access to. So for example, a good divine soul sorcerer will get the additional spell Cure Wounds. An evil one gets inflict wounds. A lawful one would get bless. A chaotic one would get bane. And a neutral one would get protection. Mm -hmm. So as you go up in level, that affinity will help you determine the types of additional divine spells that you have access to. I see. Okay. Now, if you want the very kind of typical good versus evil aspect you can straight up choose good and then we can make sure to choose a source that matches that uh -huh. but obviously you have options i'm really leaning chaotic here only because of the sorceress kind of flavor sure um plus bane just sounds cool you know? <laughs> sure well that's debatable i mean does he sound cool is debatable so the thing about these extra spells that you get, and I'm saying extra a lot to make sure that's clear, these don't count against your available spells. They're in addition to those because it's extra stuff you get for being divine origin. Okay. Okay. So it's actually extra. Yes. Unlike the unlimited on your data plan. Exactly. Okay. Cool. All right. Now, in your proficiencies option... Obviously, it's going to give you some information on the type of stuff you get by default as far as your proficiencies. So guess what? Your sorcery you don't get for armor by default. Oh, no. It tells you what kind of weapons and stuff you get. Um, but you get to choose your first two proficient skills from the sorcerer list. So now is when we start thinking about as far as your character origin is concerned, how you grew up how you've started to develop your skills because they weren't taught to you. So that's something to keep in mind with your background. Mm -hmm. What are the types of things non-magic that your character is also developing at the same time so that they are thriving and surviving? Right. Exactly. That's really good. I mean, you know, I looked at these and I picked both of these just now. So in the space of like 10 seconds, right? I'm like, I already know what I want from this list. So from the first one I get... Arcana, Deception, Insight, Intimidation, and Religion. And I would like you, without looking, to see if you can guess which one I picked. Did you pick um, Deception? I did not. Okay. Well, then what did you go with? Insight. Oh, okay. That's a good one. And for the second one, it's, you know, the stuff that's left. Right. Arcana, Deception, Intimidation, Persuasion, and Religion. I would assume persuasion. Persuasion it is. You guessed it. I did it. Good job. All right. So, this is all good. There's still things we're going to have to think about here as you create your character. Like, And maybe you don't know, but who or what is the divine influence, right? Um, that can be something we either don't flesh out because your character really has no idea or it's something that is determined because that will help flavor other things that happens. So, you know, just something to think about. And we can go through the Eberron specific list 
of deities because they're different than the ones that you're familiar with. Oh, that'd be good. All right. So before you hit next, Mm -hmm. at the top of this little page where it says class features under sorcerer, Mm -hmm. you'll notice right next to that it says spells. Yes. Need you to click on that. Done. And then click on add spells. Add spells. And you'll notice it says you get four cantrips and two other known spells. Dang. That's a lot of spells, four of which are cantrips, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, obviously, you have a giant old spell list there. So, I think what we're going to do at this point is pause and give you time to look through that and kind of make some selections. That sounds good. I'll uh, make these selections and we'll uh, take it up when I'm done. All right. All right, so you've had a chance to choose your starter spells for level one. Mm -hmm. So why don't you walk us through what you decided to go with? Okay, so I get four cantrips and two level one spells. Correct. And um, D&D Beyond just kind of uh, presented me with a list to choose from. So I just used that. Right. So my cantrips are Frostbite. Okay. Sacred Flame. Toll the Dead. Well, that's a good one. And roll a uh, word of radiance. Okay. And my first level spells, in addition to what I get from my By default, um, yeah. right, are Chaos Bolt and Ice Knife. Oh, okay. Cool. I like how you split them pretty evenly between your like influences. I'm glad you picked up on that because that's exactly what I was trying to do. <laughs> All right. So now that we've chosen your first level spells, Mm -hmm. why don't you hit that blue next button? Oh, goodness. I'm going to mash the next button. I'm going to smash the next button. All right. So we have a couple of options for your ability score generation. We can either start with your standard array and assign those as necessary. Mm. We can random roll and random assign, or we can random roll and choice assign. Um... Hmm. We did we did Carl random roll, didn't we? Well, because there's no other option in Call of Cthulhu. In, in, oh, <laughs> how soon I forget. Uh, man. Okay. Um, who's that? Uh, who's that lady on Critical Role who has that really cool like gypsy um character? Laura Bailey. Yes. And she random rolled and like the gods smiled on her and she got like three 18s and like it was all crazy. Yeah, she has a sorcerer with cra- or like a cleric with crazy strength or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, man, <laughs> that that's the dragon you always chase when you rando roll and it never works to out. To be like fair, that fifth for, edition is like, more normal people. It's more friendly for rando rolling than previous editions were. Because in previous editions, you rolled three dice and took the result. And in fifth re- fifth edition, you roll four dice and drop the lowest. So I guess it can happen to us normies, to us peasants. But I, I don't know. I feel like stuff like that happens so that it just makes you try. And, <laughs> you know, you, you shoot the moon and then you fall in the lake. <laughs> well, if you want to try random rolling. You could random roll your array, and then if the results are inadequate, your only other choice is to standard array. You know, I'm okay with that, because okay. I was going to pick standard array anyway. So, right. Or we can just do that if you want to. Well, you know, I like the idea of let's, let's gamble with that safety net, because I'm not okay. much of a gambler, you know. That's why I didn't grow up to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> All right. Well, so you're going <laughs> to... That's roll- the only reason. That's the only reason. Uh, okay. It's not because you're too big to fit in a plane. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm too tall to be an astronaut. True. Sad face. That's true. The more you know. All right. So you're going to roll 46 and take the best three to make your total. And you're going to do that six times. Okay. 4d6. Now, I'm assuming you're not just doing your stats in order that you're going to actually 
choose where the stats go, right? Yeah, I'm just rolling an array, like you said. Okay. I don't know where my bone D6 is. There it is. Ha <laughs> It's in this, like, random dice bag that's not a dice bag. Like, I don't even know what this is for. It's got a Corsair logo on it. Whatever. Probably. It's all high tech, like nylon, ballistic, fabric, huh. whatever. Roll your dice. Okay. Hmm. This is kind of shitty. Oh, not really. This one's a 12. If okay. I drop the so lowest. That's a plus one. If I drop the lowest one. Oh, literally one. <laughs> okay. So 12, which is great. Mm-hmm. It's above average. Right. Okay. And an 11. Still good. If I drop the lowest one. You're good at rolling ones. <laughs> I know. There should be an achievement for that or something. I mean, seriously. Ooh. Throwing dice on the floor. One hit the floor. I got to re-roll, re-roll that. Okay, this one is heck of shitty. It is uh, eight. If I drop the lowest one. Okay. That's not a bad score. It's an interesting score, though. Okay. And this one is another eight. Oh, okay. Things are getting getting bad. Things are getting ugly. Come on, baby. All right. This is... Looking better, because it's an 18. Uh-huh. Okay. Three sixes and a four. That's pretty cool. Okay. I have one more, right? Because I rolled five? You roll six total. Right. So I have one more. Okay. Okay. And this one is a 10. All right. Do you want to go with that, or do you want to do standard array? Well, I think I'd be better off with standard array because this one gives me two dump stats, quote unquote. <laughs> all right. I mean, we don't do dump stats and all that, but two eights. I mean, come yeah. on, man. That is a heavily flawed character to start. I mean, that being said, I'm a tiefling. You so get plus one constitution and plus two charisma conceivably I could put one of those eights in charisma and and be just normal looking. You don't want your charisma to be that low, but I don't want my charisma to be that low as a sorcerer because a sorcerer is like primary ability charisma. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't see that happening. All right. So um on your little sheet there, you're gonna choose standard array. Yes, I am. Okay. And we're just gonna go straight to charisma and throw our fifteen in there. You know. If you want to min max like that, I guess. That's fine. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> that 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 gives that gives my character a score of seventeen. Right. Which means I can spend one point in that. And jump up. Right. No, so, it's a good place to put your charisma. I'm actually not judging you. I'm just being a dick. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't notice. You have to tell me when you're doing that. I know. I do it. Hold on. I got to yell at the dog. Be nice to Jerry. I see you. See you be mean to the cat. Stop it. I love Jerry. I love you. <laughs> he doesn't love you. Leave him alone. So I like that idea. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Where is my... Okay. Oh, it only only gives me a primary ability. It doesn't give me like a secondary ability on this cheat sheet. Okay. So sorcerers, if you're going quick style, charisma should be your highest ability score followed by constitution because that's your concentration for spells. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
And then from there, it's based on your preferences on how you play your character. Yeah, all right. I'll put Constitution at 14. That sounds good. Um, Strength, I'm okay with being an 8. Dexterity can be 10. Intelligence can be 13. Wisdom can be 12. Oh, okay. So you're more in learned than you are observant. Yeah, I mean, as a sorcerer, you'd think that they, like, have more of the inherent whatever, but I'm trying to kind of subvert that a little bit. Okay, that's, I mean, obviously that's fine. Just checking in. All right, so once you've chosen all your stats, which it sounds like you have, you can click that blue next button. Smash that next button. All right. Now, the next thing that we're going to choose is your background. It came out of nowhere. Like, <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> I was just sitting here and it's just like, <laughs> that wasn't even me, dude. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I was on Reddit, obviously. And I saw a post in whatever, I don't even know what it was in, but it was like, you're in a quiet elevator, like everything is silent, and then your stomach is like, here's my impression of a whale mating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, which is weird, because I ride the elevator at work like multiple times a day, up and down and all kinds of crazy, anyway. My stomach only does it during tests. When it's super silent. That's why our friend Jesse actually gave me food oh. at a test one time. is because nice. I was disturbing his ability to take a test with my stomach. <laughs> he went into his bag and got food out because I was bothering him. What the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> Giving my you stomach is so eye. loud. It's the loudest stomach. Like, here, eat this. Also, shut up. <laughs> okay. All right, so for background, obviously you can choose one that's matching what you're starting to think of as your character, uh -huh. or we can rando it. Oh, man. Um, I've, I think I should pick something that kind of matches what I'm starting to think of as sure. my character. Because yeah. this is where it really starts to take place. Yeah. Or take shape, I mean. Right, right. So things to keep in mind because it's Eberron. Mm -hmm. A lot of these backgrounds have additional options that are Eberron specific as far as traits that you can pick. Yeah. Um, otherwise, in the backgrounds, if you go down to the H section, that's where all your house agents occur if you wanted to be tied to a house as part of your background. Um, but yeah, otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I don't think any of those are going to work. Uh, see, the problem is I don't know what any of these mean. So, um, I can give you the basic rundown of them. Um, okay. So you have to click on each one. Right. And then no, you don't. I can, I can send you a quick link too. Hold on. It gives you a little bit more of a glance at a glance of them. Okay. Just things that you can expand so that you can see each one. Okay. Well, I mean, it tells you a little bit, like, at a glance, the proficiencies it gives you, and the tags tell you the type of background it is. It's oh. only the feature that you'd have to expand for, really. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So you've had a chance to choose your background. What did you end up selecting? I ended up picking Cloistered Scholar. All right, at this point, it's probably a good idea to give everyone kind of your thoughts behind why you chose that background and what you're starting to think of as your character. Okay, I'm going to try and keep this uh, short and sweet, but I, I really like the baked-in dichotomy that a character who is a um, the Levistus-style tiefling and the divine soul sorcerer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I like the baked in dichotomy of the race and class that this character has of the, you know, demonic, uh, 
infernal uh, legacy tiefling and the divine soul sorcerer. So um, I'm thinking of kind of a, a disgraced house kind of situation, um, like a minor house that's like a, a banner house to a, a grander one that at some point in its history made a bargain with uh, Levistus, and now that has cursed their house for you know generations and they're not acknowledged and they're outcast and they just kind of live in this squalid decrepit like ruin of a hold fast on the outskirts of the former holdings of this greater house and they've been it's been their overall quest for generations to redeem themselves and get back to where they were. So um, they're, they're pinning their hopes on this child that has come to them who has prophesied to be this like um, divine soul among them. And so when my character was born and it was like, prophecies were starting to be fulfilled and or or perceived to be fulfilled they were sent off you know to hide them and to educate them and to keep them good and pure and all that so um they uh ended up being you know uh sent to private school basically to not only be hidden from the powers that be that would want to oppose that child but also uh, to prepare them for the quest to come. Okay. So, as part of your background, we are now going to figure out some of your characteristics and your proficiencies and such. So, um, you get history by default, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you get to choose another one. Right, from uh, arcana, nature, or religion? Right, other things you would have learned about during your time cloistered away okay. mm. arcana nature and religion are like the big ones right those always come up i feel like depending on how slash why they sent you to be hidden away and schooled mm -hmm. religion is an obvious choice true um, but the other two make a lot of sense as well especially arcana in this world Nature, depending on where you're from or where you are sent to, can also make a lot of sense. So it would kind of depend on how you want to weave your background. Yeah, I think for this one, we're going to choose Arcana. Okay. Then you get to choose two languages in addition to the ones you know by default. All right. Do we care why we chose Arcana at this point? or I mean, you can talk about it if you want to. I feel like um, mom and dad would have exerted their influence over the faculty to ensure that little Billy had uh, schooling in Arcana kind of as a focus to be prepared for, um, you know, what he may have to deal with as an adversary uh, in his life later okay. on. So uh, that's why I picked Arcana. Sure. Languages. Hmm. Abyssal is good. <laughs> uh, huh. Oh, you know, under common, not really. I mean, you can straight up go Abyssal and Celestial if you want to. Yeah. Or you mm. can choose things that are more regionally appropriate. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how Abyssal and Celestial would figure in as as a role playing sort of situation. Yeah, you because know, you get to pick any two languages because it's plausible with this background that you would have learned whatever. Right. And so you start off with certain languages already. As a tiefling sorcerer, you're going to start off with what? Common and something from tiefling, I imagine. I don't know what those are. I just don't want to double down. 
Well, you can't choose something that's already been chosen. Okay, that's the beauty of D&D Beyond. It just won't let you mess up. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Abyssal and Celestial because... You get Common and Infernal by default. Okay. Well, then I shouldn't pick Abyssal. Celestial makes sense still. I'm trying to think of what I would have picked up as the common language around my my monastery or cloister or whatever. Well, what kind of cloister do you think they sent you to? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it would be as far away as possible from where I'm from. You have the maps? Hmm, that's true. I can tell you about the different regions if you see one that catches your eye. So... The main regions you said, right, are Carnath, Thrain, Brayland, Ondir, Sire, which is now the Morning Mornlands, and area. Morelands. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. So I want to say Carnath would make sense for for this guy to be from. Oh, so you're from one of the one Yeah, of the five? I, I don't I don't yeah, he would definitely be from one of the main like five okay. provinces. He wouldn't be from the Wild West. Cause, Cause like I said, the idea is that, you know, he's of a a former minor house that's liege to a bigger house. And I like the idea that it's you know, bordering Mornland, even though the whole I thing that made them what they are is from before the morning. So Karnath is a really interesting nation. Um, as part of its history, um, like Karnath is known for having kind of like very um, difficult winters um, based on its location. There, It can have a lot of extreme storms and stuff like that. So its people are accustomed to like surviving through hmm. um and they are known for their military tradition it's the colorado of <laughs> <Eberron>. okay <laughs> and um so they're not known for their magic or anything like that um but during the last war there were a number of plagues and um kind of supply issues that Karnath faced. And so the nation kind of as a whole turned to following a faith that involved um, raising undead forces to bolster their numbers because they weren't surviving well. Okay. And so to date, even after the treaty of Thronehold was signed, um, a lot of people still support the use of undead in the support of the nation and may still even follow religions uh, along those lines. Huh. Okay. Well, all right. That doesn't seem to really fit with what I'm, with what I'm thinking. And I don't have to be from one of the five main places. No. I kind of thought that I did, but I don't, um, because looking at the map, like, Eldine Reaches and Droam, like, also would would kind of work, possibly. Yep, so, uh, Droam is a nation, well, what the other nations would consider to be a nation of monsters, so it tends to have a lot of the races that are not as welcome in the other regions. Um, so you'll find things like centaurs and changelings and all sorts of, you know, more monstrous races in higher numbers in that area. Drum is ruled by a threesome of hags um, known as the sisters. And their kind of goal right now after the end of the last war is to actually be recognized 
as a nation because Druam was left out of the treaty and not recognized as a nation in its own right. Mm -hmm. Um, The Eldine Reaches is, um, as you can see by all the trees they put in it, it is a wilderness kind of full area. Um, There is a lot of Druidic tradition in that area, Mm -hmm. and it is also home of one of the great houses. So, dog settling in bed very loudly because she barked. <laughs> so, it is the the largest city in the reaches is Varna, which is the seat of the Dragon Mart House of Vatalis. Um, and they're known for taming all manner of beasts huh. and breeding them. Okay. My sea. Now... In Eldin, in the Eldin reaches specifically, uh, with the ideas that you have for your house, it is possible that they either fell afoul of the major house that's there, or a group called the Gatekeepers, which are pretty powerful in that area, because the Gatekeepers work to protect the world from unnatural threats such as fiends, and so they. So they kind of try to um, create wards to prevent demons from coming through the Kyber and stuff like that. Um, So they would have been against any sort of working with or allowing demonic influence into the area. Hmm. Okay. Uh, It makes sense because they kind of butt up against something called the demon wastes. Yes. So... So the demon wastes are kind of as they sound. It's kind of a lot of lava and vulcan- volcanic glass and ash. Um, there is like slime and moss, but not a lot of vegetation. And thousands of years ago, before the last war and one of the other great wars, um, demons ruled certain areas of Corvair of this continent. And so the demon waste was actually the seat of power of the ruling demons for those areas of Corvair. And they had their lesser servants like Rakshasa and stuff like that, that worked for them um, as their underlings. And so there are rumors that there are old ruins there that still have a lot of dark magic and it, still may house fiends or other treasures or arcane powers. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think Eldine is uh, uh, the best fit for this guy. Okay. So we'll kind of put you in the Eldine reaches for now. Okay, so based on that kind of idea, where do you think or with what kind of group do you think they would send you for your cloistering. I think that they would want to send him uh, as far away as possible, not only in terms of distance, but in contrast. So Eldine's way out in the forest. It's in the boonies. It's all, you know, uh, rustic and rural. So, I feel like they would probably send him to the big city far away on the coast in Sharn. Okay. So you think that at a young age you were sent to the city? Yes. Okay. That is fair enough. That will make some of this a little bit easier. So thinking about that, um, there are a few kind of groups of learning that are pretty well known in Sharn that they might have selected. Um, There is um, kind of the more prestigious groups like the Arcanics and the Library of Kornberg. And then there is Morgrave University, which is the largest institution, but um, it's known for its more hands-on style of teaching rather than being as book-based. Um, so, you know, there are, there are a few different 
kind of groups that would all make sense there. So we can figure that out as we get there. But that definitely makes sense. There are a lot of options there that they could have sent you to. Okay. So based on which school that that I end up in, that would really influence the language. Because one of them's celestial that I'm taking, but the other one, I think would be something that he picked up more um, mundane, so to speak. So it, it would be um, the language of the common folk around this school. So not necessarily the high speech or what have you, but like what the janitors and cooks and stuff are, are speaking. The ubiquitous, low-born... Uh, common folk. Well, that's the thing about Sharn is even in the lower wards, um, you have a really big mix. I would say that humans and dwarves are probably the two most common though in Sharn overall. Okay. I wonder what would make up the, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but the immigrant uh, working class. Well, at the time that you're sent there, it's most likely still during the war. So we're not going to see a big influx of refugees yet. Mm -hmm. Once the refugees start coming in, I would say probably you're going to see a lot more shifters um, and similar are going to be part of that refugee class and other folks from the Morn lands. Okay. So dwarvish kind of starts to make sense for a language based on what you've told me. So we'll pick that for now. Okay. All right. So I have the skill proficiency and two languages chosen. Right. So now we're going to get into your characteristics. So if you pop open that suggested characteristics one. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. You need to roll 2d8 for your personality traits. Here we go. So we decided to random roll these bad boys. Okay. 2d8, you say? Well, you need to roll it twice. I mean, it's up to you if you roll two at the same time or one at a time. I don't care. Uh, I'll roll two at once. All right. I got two ones. Well, you you have to have different numbers, so one of them has to be re-rolled. Sorry. Okay. (laughs) And I got an eight. All right. All right. So one, if you keep it, is you use polysyllabic words to convey the impression of great erudition. Okay. And eight is that you're convinced that people are trying to steal your secrets. Okay. I'm going to go with uh, convinced about the secrets because... You still need two, so that means you have to re-roll for your second one. Okay. So I just roll one D8 again. Right, until you get two that you like. You you have to have two traits. You need two personality traits. Gotcha. All right, six. You speak slowly when talking to idiots, which almost everyone is compared to you. Fantastic. Okay. I can work with that. Okay. So you can add those two if you like. I did. I did add those two. All right. 1d6 gives you an ideal, or you can choose based on your perceived alignment. Um, yeah. I'm just going to, we're going to, we're going to keep with the rando rolling and we're going to rando roll it. Five. Knowledge is the path to power and domination. Nice. All right, a d6 for bonds. Here we go. Four. All right, your life's work is a series of tomes related to a specific field of lore. Do you find yourself to be a writer? Uh, not really. You may re-roll if you like. Six. You sold your soul for knowledge and hoped to do great deeds to win it back. Hmm. I mean, kind of. <laughs> like, 
Great. We can we can adjust that one, I think, to work for you. Hmm. It's in line with the character idea that you're thinking of, I think. Yeah. All right. We'll go and add that one. And a D6 for a flaw. Here we go. Six. All right. What do you got there? I can't keep a secret to save my life or anyone else's. Do you think that's fair or do you think that's not in line with your character as you're starting to see them? Because obviously you have your own secrets. Uh Uh-huh. That's true. Uh, yeah, not really. Okay. That really doesn't fit. I mean, for this dude, I seriously, like, being easily distracted by the promise of information seems to kind of fit. Yeah, so grab that one if you like it. From this table. So not 100% random rolled, but at this point, you kind of... We're zeroing in. Yeah, we're zeroing in. You got to take a little license. Okay. So now we're going to do a few things that are going to be before, like before you continue. Okay. Um, that are going to be specific to Eberron. So they're not going to be things you can add from there. I see. But you can still type them into your little character sheet thing. If you kind of scroll down, you'll notice there's a personal characteristic section that's starting to be filled in. Mm-hmm. If you open that up. Okay. Got it. And then are you in the personal characteristics or physical characteristics? I think I'm in physical characteristics. Okay. Here we go. So you can manually add some as well. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we are going to do some rolls. I need you to roll 1d10, please. Three. All right. You, somewhere in your history that we'll have to figure out, have murdered a rival. Your actions may have been justified. But your rival's face still haunts you. Okay. All right. I need you to roll another d10. Here we go. Six. Uh, I need you to roll a different d10. That one won't work for a short campaign. Here we go. I'm going to roll the same d10. Well, I need you to roll. <laughs> <I know. Okay. laughs> ten. Do you want your character to have a lover? Um. For the sake of this campaign? Uh, not really. Okay, then roll again. Three. You own an uncommon uncommon magic item, but you had to sell it to a pawn shop for some reason. If you can't reclaim it within the month, they'll sell it. Okay. All right. All right. Question. Mm-hmm. Obviously, while you were a child, the war was still happening. Right. The last war. Mm-hmm. Did you have any involvement at all in the war or what was kind of your interaction with wartime? I would say that I knew about it happening because conscripts from, you know, my house would be sent to um, to fight in the war. And I would see the results of that as far as, you know, um, people not coming back at all, people coming back broken and wounded and and so on and you know that sort of thing the small town experience of war i would have seen firsthand and been aware of it uh, well to be fair you were probably in the city during a lot of your formative years hmm, when the mm-hmm. war was happening fair enough but a, but a smaller city i guess sharn's the biggest city i would have already been sent to sharn by this point <clears throat> Is what we're saying. Right. Okay. Um, Unless they didn't send you to Sharn until after the treaty. I mean, that timeline's kind of up to you. I guess it depends on, like, how young a child we're talking about, you know? Because I would, I would have had a, uh, a childhood, you know, in, in Eldeen. And then, and then I would have uh, been sent to Sharn at like around the age of ten or whatever. So it depends on like, okay, you know, before or after that that we're talking about. So if it's before, it would have been. Remember, the war just ended, and your character when we start the game officially is level eleven. 
So Oof. you're very well established in the world. Wow. Okay. So you grew up during the war. Hmm. All right. So experience with the war then would have been very, um, like a pundit sort of situation, a very scholarly sort of um, political kind of uh, analysis of current events and so on, sort of a. But you were never involved in the war. No. All right. So we'll say that your background means that like the influence of your family prevented you from having to serve in the war in any capacity. Yeah. You you got the college like waiver, like you're a student, like, you know, so you don't get conscripted and whatnot. Okay. All right. What did you think of the morning? The morning was very mysterious and therefore very interesting because it would have to have an explanation and an origin. And there's never an effect without a cause. So it's very intriguing to me. And also it was very powerful. So that kind of calls to me uh, as well, because a source of power that great could potentially be used for uh, other other things and could possibly be turned to other ends that might be personally profitable. Okay. Who did you develop a relationship with when you were sent away from home? Because obviously you grew up, your early childhood was at home, but you were sent away at an early enough age to Sharn that you've probably kind of inherited some found family members, um, some chosen folk. So who have you developed relationships with away from home? So there are three that jump to mind immediately when you ask that question. Two are two classmates that I would have become uh, fast friends with that I would have been in the same classes with, that we would have had mutual interests and a friendship would have developed organically and we would have become very close friends all through school and and beyond, you know, whatever that means. Uh, I feel like we're still uh, in uh, the, the monastery or whatever, um, the university grounds somehow, you know, um, but we would have been, uh, close enough to keep in touch and so on. The third is a, um, a steward. If that makes sense, someone from the house that they would have sent with me there to be their kind of, uh, not only eyes and ears on me and stuff like that to report, back to them but to like keep track of me sort of a an alfred to sure. my batman is he also a tiefling um he's definitely like an agent of the house or a butler or whatever is he warforged um could be i mean i, I don't know if that makes sense for a, a minor house from eldine but um it, it would be something that fits in with with that like what sort of creature or person i don't think he's necessarily also tiefling you know okay like he's not necessarily um a member of the household like the family but he's like on their staff so he would be someone you know respected and um, trusted, but not necessarily of the inner circle, so to speak. Okay. We can think a little bit more on that. Um, being from the Eldine reaches could be humanoid, uh, elven, any of the more wild races like fur bulgs and things like that. Um, he could be fey of some kind mm -hmm. because there's a lot of overlap there with that. Yeah. Something um, old and wise and um laid back really makes sense you know and all the hustle and bustle of the world you know 
this person is is very has has a very high degree of chill. Okay. Do you think at this point that your classmates are human or are they something else? They could be literally anything. Okay, it doesn't matter at this point. Doesn't matter. Uh, Mm -hmm. Do you know kind of what they were studying there? Are they wizards? Are they sorcerers? Are they fighters? Like what sort of thing do you expect them to be? I think one guy, you know, one, one person would be a fighter. One person would be a jock, right? And the other person would be a nerd. And so the jock is very fiery, very martial, very, you know, uh, physically adept whereas the other uh friend is very much into uh chemical stuff okay and you know making uh like an alchemist type alchemist stuff that explodes stuff that dissolves things that go together and all of that sort of thing okay so one of them is kind of an alchemist and is there studying functionally chemistry and magical chemistry. Mm-hmm. And the other is probably there to study like history and strategy and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Right. For what kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. And Cause they have the... to be scholarly still, but things right. that kind of make sense for them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. And, and still, you know, the, the fighter guy can still pursue, physical stuff right you know training in the yard and running around the walls and all that stuff so i think that'll do it for that sort of little section for now let's go through some more mundane details all right so physical characteristics Mm -hmm. we'll get we'll get to the easy stuff okay what's your hair color and style um it's just gonna Go with basic uh, black hair that okay. tends to grow um, in a back type of direction. So it just sort of doesn't really need to be kept. It's straight black hair. Like Loki? Yeah. Or okay. is it somewhat long, but not super long? It just kind of grows that way and you just sort of lets it do its thing. Okay. Skin color. Uh, this one is interesting because tiefling tend to be, um, somewhat reddish. Well, that's, I would say that's a stereotype, but yeah. (laughs) Okay. Um, so this character is, uh, of a very icy hue, very, um, viscous touched sort of skin color. So, uh. Almost a, a blue gray, almost uh, ice giant kind of color sure. in terms of skin color. So not not really blue or blue white, but like a a, a gray blue kind of kind of color. Yeah, that that sounds good. All right, um, eye color. Hmm. Okay. Um. And in contrast to the skin color, his eye color is this almost glowing, like, um, gold, yellow gold that is reminiscent of the uh, divinity that he's influenced by. Okay. So tieflings tend to be size-wise and shape-wise very similar to humans mm-hmm. because that's what they descend from. Right. So what would you think of as your character's build? Um, He would be, uh, I'm pretty sure I took strength as 8 and dexterity as 10. So yeah. his build reflects that. Okay. Um, he is, you know, slender and slight and not, you know, particularly... Um, well toned or built in any way, you know, reflective right. of his life spent over books and so on. Right. And I know you typically play male characters. Are you playing in a, a male character this time? Yes. Okay. Do you have horns or other distinguishing demonic features? Uh, yes. Definitely has horns. Yeah. What type of horns? And I was, I was hoping to go with um, 
the type of horns that could conceivably be hidden to a certain degree by a hood or cowl. So the, you know, big like Hellboy horns or similar, uh, or the long horn out to the side right. horns aren't going to work for that. So um, they either have to be small, right. like little tiny devil horns, satyr horns, right. or they need to be like um, the curling, like, you know. More like uh, a ram's horn ram, sort of. Yeah, type of horn. Okay. So, I'll let you think on that a little bit. Yeah, we'll have to Do consider. you have a tail? Ugh. I think that that depends on how pronounced his horns are. Because it's got to be like... Typically, tieflings have thick tails. Okay. So then, yes. Okay. Um, typically, you have pronounced canine teeth. Mm-hmm. Is that also in your case? Yes. Okay. Um, their eyes are usually solid color. You went with gold, which is totally in line. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then skin tones can vary from human coloration to shades of red or, in your case, blue, which is fine. Um, and then they usually have dark hair, so that totally works out as well. So, yeah, I think you have the start of a very strong tiefling character. Now, when your parents named you, did they give you a tiefling name? Or did they give you a more human or Eldin area specific name? Uh, I feel like they would have given him a um either a human or regional name more likely a regional name um and yeah it, it would have been like a regional name through and through there would be no tiefling sort of okay situation going on cuz they're kind of in denial about that whole thing okay. and trying to get away from it so they're not like embracing the tiefling thing Gotcha. Let's go ahead and pick your equipment. So if you hit next after you fill in your stuff. Okay. I didn't put in an age. Right. That's okay. Yeah. We're, we have to establish some of your background stuff, and then we'll figure out where we're leaving you to start the main adventure. Okay. So I hit next. We're doing equipment. Yep. So I'm going to have you choose equipment rather than gold. Because we're okay. going to give you your starting stuff, and then you'll have a chance to get additional things through your session zero plays. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So, starting stuff, you can choose either a light crossbow with bolts or any other simple weapon. Uh, I'll choose uh, any simple weapon and a quarter staff. Classic. All right. You can either have a component pouch or an arcane focus. Um, I'll go with a arcane. <laughs> I can pick an arcane focus and a staff, and I can have my quarter staff and this staff be the same thing. I think <laughs> that would be cool. Sure. Um, I wonder. <laughs> I can pick a rod or a staff. <laughs> huh. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with component pouch. I think actually. that's a great idea, especially for a sorcerer. I always think that feels a little bit more natural than having an arcane focus since, you know, you don't necessarily need something for your power. Yeah, that's kind of what occurred to me. Like, why am I going arcane focus? Component pouch just makes so much more sense. All right, and then you have Dungeoneer's pack or Explorer's pack. Based on your background, I think Explorer makes more sense, but, I mean, feel free to do what you think is best. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Explorer's pack is fine. And then you automatically get two daggers by default because you can never have too many knives. Right. All right. You also, for your background, automatically get robes of your cloister. And we'll figure out exactly who that is. Mm -hmm. You get a writing kit. You get a borrowed book on the subject of your current study, which will determine what that is. And you get 10 gold to start. Nice. So go ahead and click the add starting equipment button. Cool. Yay. Done. All right. And then if you go to your inventory there, like if you click where it says inventory, mm -hmm. go ahead and wield your quarter staff or whatever it is that you chose so that you have it in your 
character sheet appropriately. I have it in my hands. Yes. All right. Now, if you click next, that should take you to a place where you can view your character sheet. Okay. And this is going to be your level one character sheet, which we'll use to start your first kind of session zero vignette. Then we'll bump up your level, choose your new options, do another vignette, bump up your level, choose your options, do another vignette, and then we'll lead you into where you actually start the game. Wow. This is all moving so fast. Yeah. Okay. At this point, what I recommend, if you scroll back to the top on the right side, there's the uh, anvil Mm -hmm. icon. If you click on that, that takes you back to your builder. Um, From there, if you, um, on the home tab, that's where you can kind of think about your name and choose a portrait. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Which we'll kind of do to kind of wrap things up for this part of the session. Then we'll pause and we'll get into your first vignette when we come back. That sounds good. I just got to say, thinking up a name is going to take forever. So (laughs) that's probably something I'll do offline. Yeah, I think that sounds good. All right, let's take a step back. Um, Since we're going to be leveling your character up a little bit, I want to do it kind of in stages. And because you won't be adventuring through those levels, we need to have some place to put in some items for you to have gained over your experience. Items and acquaintances and contacts and things as appropriate for a character of that level. Right. But we're going to start with an item. So I need you to roll D100, please. Can do. Coming right up. That's a 49. (laughs) All right. Uh, Let's see. Okay, I'm going to roll a couple of dice for you over here. I've always wanted a dice roller. All right, go ahead and give yourself 50 gold. And you can do that on your little character sheet. All right, so you added your 50 gold. I added the 50 gold, so I'm a total of 60 right now. Because the background uh, yes. gave me 10. Exactly. All right. And I need you to roll one more D100, please. 22. All right. You have a potion of healing in your inventory. Can so do. The cool thing about your character sheet is you can add it straight from there as well. And it'll have the full description and everything. Potion of healing. Just a regular one, right? Correct. Add. You're level one, so that's what you get. Added. Awesome. All right. So now that we've gotten that first part out of the way, we're going to talk a little bit about a defining characteristic or occasion that happened when you were younger. So you've talked a little bit with me, and some of that was off mic, um, where you have an idea that kind of the forces that you interact with um, on your divine soul side and your tiefling side kind of interact with you in your head. Right. Okay. So when you were young, there was a day that you strayed a little bit too far into the woods outside of your family estate. And as you were kind of looking around and playing in the trees, you were encountered by a group of local youths. Utes? Yes. And what you would functionally think of as the leader of that little group started calling you a monster Mm -hmm. um, and started threatening you, telling you that they were going to show you what happened to monsters where they're from. Around these parts? Yep. Okay. And it was one of the first times that the voices that you heard kind of gave you choices. And so one of them told you to make an example of him in front of the others and offered you access to a spell that would strike him through with ice. Okay. And the other agreed that an example should be made, but gave you the option of a spell that would make him look weak as his attacks failed against you. What did you do? I was a kid at this point. 
Yes, you were young. Okay. A young sorcerer, but young nonetheless. Young. Okay, the tiefling age about the same as humans. About. So I had to be like 10, 11, whatever, something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think that. that's fair. Okay. So I feel like as a kid, I would have made the wrong choice. And, that's and, fair. Kids are sociopaths and whatnot. Yeah. So I would have gone with the uh, force uh, option, I believe. All right. So going to your character sheet, because that'll have all your references... You should have access to, I believe it's Ray of Frost because of your background. Yes. I'd like you to go ahead and cast your spell. So roll your attack. Eight. Total. All right. So you kind of nod to yourself, to the voice that's in your head, and your hand kind of flexes almost instinctively, and... Um, a shard of ice bursts forth from it and shatters against the uh, armor that the bully is wearing under his clothing. Oh, wow. An armored bully. Yeah. Interesting. Apparently they're playing guards and fairies out in the woods. Hmm. For keeps, apparently. If they're wearing armor. All right. Um, I'm going to have you roll um, one more time. Okay. One more time. So we're not doing a full encounter or anything, but just to kind of see how it plays out. All right. It's uh, 17. Okay. So he kind of gives you a laugh and like pushes you back. And as he does, you sling another spell, basically. Um, this one hitting him kind of right under the chin and it knocks him back and blood starts pouring where he kind of bit his tongue and uh, he scrambles back and kind of calls his friends off. And he's like, let him, let him go back to his stupid, lonely monster life. And they all run off and you are victorious in this encounter. Yeah. A smart, a smart person would have gone the other way, but uh, maybe, I don't know. Who knows? I think a kid would have gone for the, the blast. No, I think, it's a fine choice. All right. So that brings us through kind of your your little childhood and the types of interactions you might have had with locals because you didn't interact with them very much. Let's go ahead and bump you up to level five. Okay. Cool. All Done. right. So if you scroll down, I don't know if it shows any choices on this main screen, but they'll be highlighted if there's something to change. Um, looks like you can do meta magic, two choices from third level and ability score improvement, one choice from fourth level. Yep. Okay. So we can pause and you can make your character advancement choices. We'll also choose equipments and such. Okay. So now you have all your spells chosen and your ability score increases and everything. I do. How old do you think you were when your parents sent you off to school? pretty young when they sent me off so um i don't know however old you are in in like first grade so like what nine eight in first grade yeah you're like six six okay yeah so i was like a little little kid six okay. six years old then we'll kind of have to retcon your bully adventure oh Okay. So that you're younger oh, than that. Because that would have happened at home? Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't know that. So then uh, let's say that was part of what facilitated me being sent away. Sure. So um, we'll, we'll say I was 11. Okay. So they sent you off and they weren't going with you, but they sent with you a steward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like a butler and Alfred kind yes. of character is what I was thinking. So let's think a little bit more about him. Does he have any special talents? What race do we think he is? Are there any things he specifically was tasked with when they sent him with you? Like those kind of things, just little details to help me out. Yeah, so I have kind of a, when, when I think of him, you know, I think he's like tall and like lanky, not tall and big, you know, if that makes right. sense. And um, his talents and abilities and whatever. Um, I don't get a whole lot of that. I get his demeanor as being um, soft-spoken, voice of reason 
type of uh, calm sort of guy, you know? Right. Uh, but also underneath that, there's this like undercurrent of like former soldier, right? Like the reason he's so chilled out is he has behind him a lifetime of violence. Right. So, and, and he, he knows what that's like. So he's just like super laid back because nothing is worth uh, a potential escalating conflict except for when something is. And then when it is, he can like be really quick to action, but like, he's just, he's just so laid back and chilled. You would never suspect, you know? So like, I don't know, maybe like a warrior monk or like, a you know, a, a, a soldier, but like more of the, uh, officering type, you know, but okay. who wasn't command from afar you know, but like a combat officer type okay. of thing cool. and then retired and then, you know, is like in the service of the family as part of his like, you know, pension or whatever. Right. So, um, and that's why he gets sent off with, you know, young dude, you know, young master, whatever. Um, yeah, as far as race is concerned, I feel like he might probably be a tiefling or, I mean, as well, or a race that would associate with a tiefling disgraced fallen house, you know, right. some race from um, the area where they live, kind of rural sort of in that area. So it's a forested kind of fey forest area. So we can do any of the fey touched races like Ladrin and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, like based on his background, it might make sense for him to be a ranger of some kind. Maybe okay. a martial ranger, though. Sure. You know? um, and or, I mean, he could be really kind of any sort of humanoid not necessarily associated with civilization. Like any of the phase, any of those uh, outside of civilization um, humanoids. And then again, because of where you are, you certainly could have had someone who came over from Droem or the like the demon lands area and stuff like that, too. So you could definitely open up your options to things that are a little bit more tiefling friendly as well. Okay. So... I don't know, like, we're looking at Elf, Furbolg, um, and then all of the Fey touched, like you were saying. Right. Could be a Minotaur. <laughs> no, I, I think that... But that would be too big, I think, for yeah, what you're thinking. That, and I mean, you know, it, it can be whatever. I just, what what springs to mind is another humanoid body plan type race. Sure. And a... Um, I mean, he can straight up be human. That's okay, too. True. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just so many um, options. Like, man. You could roll. <laughs> tabaxi would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. like Tabaxi would just be super rad. Like he just has this like, you know, um, cat guy butler type of sure. person. And not like a butler, but like, a, you know, like I, I don't know what you call it, where it's your, your babysitter, your minder, your, your, your steward. Yeah, I've just been referring to him as your steward, but we can certainly give him another title. Yeah, it's it's like, like what what do you okay? Because <laughs> all I can think of is governess, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> your nanny, but like, what is that role when it's you know a guy taking care of like a male child? Is there a huge difference? I don't even know. Like, I whatever. Anyway, it's it's that kind of role. But it's a couple of dudes, <laughs> so right. You know, it's not like Jane Austen style shit over here. So, well, I mean, we'll we'll 
pick a good race that would make sense, I guess. But, okay. But, you know, Tabaxi would be pretty cool. And they sure. do have, like, inherent, you know, plus one to charisma, yeah. you know. Because, like I said, he's he is these days very social. Right. You know what I mean? But I feel like... Especially it, because there's probably a lot of scenarios with you being a tiefling where it makes sense for him to do certain interactions instead of you. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And, you know... um. If it's not game breaking or whatever, I'm not trying to, you know, whatever, throw a wrench into the works. It's just if he's like an older, established, you know, whatnot. I don't know how big of a companion this guy is going to be. So No, you don't. So, all right, cool. So if, if he's not going to be super interactive or whatever, he would be, you know, one of those characters that has kind of developed a little bit more to where, you know, his background is all like, um, Marshall, you know, and then in his retirement, he's more social. So that's, that's all I was thinking. Okay. Uh, I will just have to bother you for details off mic then. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, sounds good. What, whatever you think is best. So when you travel to Sharn, cause that's where you're being sent to school. Mm hmm. Um, the war was still going on at that time. And so you were in a carriage, you had guards that were accompanying you on horseback. Um, and at one point your carriage was beset by a group of rogue soldiers. Bandits. Sure. I mean, they refer to themselves as soldiers, so. Rogue soldiers. Um, the guards yelled for you to stay inside and to keep the shutters closed. Okay. Your steward, as of yet unnamed and with limited information, but we do know he has a martial background, so I'm thinking instead of staying in there with you, he probably sighs heavily and gets out of the carriage. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Um, Probably watch, you know, from the whatever curtains, I guess. A carriage yeah, would have? Yeah, it has like shutters. Shutters, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you'd like part them a little bit so that you can peek out and, and watch like what's going on. Because I don't know that he would necessarily be, you know, super uh, impetuous or, right. you know, he said, stay in here. He's not going to like, you know, okay, and then immediately get out and get people killed, which is what kids do in fiction. Right. So, um, I don't know that he would do that. He would hang back kind of like, whoa, what's going on? Right. Especially having kind of a, I don't know, sheltered upbringing, you know? It's not like he's going to have experience with highwaymen and brigands and whatever else, right. and outlaws and stuff like that. You kind of keep to yourself in your little, you know, keep and have right. a low profile because you're a tiefling and you're out in the boonies and you're despised. So right. he, he would just hang back. Okay. Yeah, you had read about such things, but yeah, you've, you've never encountered them before. And so you kind of watch and listen. You see your steward kind of talking with them. Um, you see some threatening gestures from the soldiers. Um, and then you see your steward like very quickly just strike out at one of them and kind of knocking him to the ground, almost making him take a knee. Gasp. Um, and then quickly just sort of like, we're assuming he's tabaxi at this point. Yeah. So kind of like licking the back of his hand <laughs> where it was soiled. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and this goes on for a while. Like, you know, your steward doesn't like make a lot of like large sweeping gestures or anything like that. You just kind of see his head nodding as he talks with them. The other guards staying back. Um, and eventually you see him give a very small purse to one of them and he gestures for them to leave and they do. Okay. He buys them off. All right. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So we're going to give you a little bit more treasures at this point because we're going to do some more leveling. So I'm going to have you go ahead and roll D100, please. And go ahead and do that twice because we're going to do a couple of jumps here. 
Okay, we got a 78. And a 2. All right, 78 and 2. All right, so cool. We're going to give you a couple more items, and then we're going to bump your level up again. Okay. All right, so I would like you to roll one D100, please. Uh, 39. Okay. All right, you have another potion of healing. Okay. All right, and then... Or your 78, which is much higher. Ooh. Roll D100, please. 75. 75. All right, you have a potion of cloud giant strength. Oh, nice. Wow, cloud giant. That's uh, very specific. (laughs) I just mean it's you know higher than like a hill giant or what have you. Oh, yeah. So in the hierarchy of giants. So that changes my strength score to twenty seven for one hour. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Before we level you up, we'll just establish a couple of more things. Okay. So when you were in the university in Sharn. Um, which was very alien to you because you went from kind of this almost country manner mm-hmm. to the largest metropolis in the continent, on right. the continent. Yeah. Um, a place known as the City of Towers because of how far up they've built to the point where one of the levels of the City of Towers is literally built on solidified clouds. It floats above the rest of the city. Cool. I bet that's where the rich people live. It is. So I'm going to give you this little traveler's guide to Sharn that I made so you know a little bit about the districts. Thank you. So as you know, there's different kind of quarters, if you will, and it's separated by level. So that kind of gives you the basics of all of the main areas. I see. Okay. So while you're at university, you didn't leave it very often, especially while the war was still on. But as the war ended and you grew older, you started to venture out a little bit with your friends. What kinds of things do you think that you liked to do in the city when you left school? I think I would have liked to explore the city and see its many sites and um, learn the layout of the city, learn your way around. Right. You know? And um, learn shortcuts right. and uh, alternate routes to places and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think especially in a city like Sharn, you probably knew like where the lifts were that didn't have too many people waiting for them usually. You knew the best place to like use some of your spells to quickly navigate areas because you do have the ability to fly and things like that. So you knew how to get from place to place in a way that wouldn't attract too much attention from the city watch either. Yeah, like just moving around the city and exploring. And then, like I said, going down and like, what's up with the cogs? That's kind of neat. And oh, like, right. Uh-huh. How do those clouds work? Like, oh, there's a tour of whatever, and, you know, that sort of thing. Because it's a big city, so there's going to be lots of touristy shit. So early on, you'd spend a lot of your time doing that touristy type of crap. Okay. But also getting um, to know how to navigate through the city as well. I think that's fair. And we have established that you made two kind of close friends, one who was an alchemist type and one who was a jock type is what (laughs) we were calling him. Yeah. I think we'll um, flesh those out a little bit off mic. Yeah. And kind of introduce them in the next one because I already know where they are in there, but it will be good to have them a little bit more developed. Okay. And for now, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get you up to level 11. So we'll pause really briefly and kind of get you to the level you're going to be at. Okay. And then we'll kind of summarize and wrap up. Sounds good. All right. All right. Now that you have finished leveling up, we'll just do a quick overview Um, talk a little bit about our plans for the sessions, and then we will call it for this bonus episode. Okay, and the character creation, it's been a long, hard road. (laughs) So you did end up with a level 11 sorcerer. You are a Levistus tiefling. 
and you're going with a male. He's not named yet, but I will force you to do that short. Thing. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna flesh him out a little bit. All right. So, um, as part of things you chose, I will get into a little bit of it. Um, your proficient skills are Arcana, History, Insight, and Persuasion, fitting with your character. You are tough, so you have a buttload of hit points, even though you're a sorcerer. Um, Mm -hmm. You are a divine soul sorcerer, so it gives you some kind of abilities to empower your healing and have a few extra spells. And that will give you kind of the dichotomy you're looking for between good and evil with your character. Right. Right. You have a ton of spells that I'm not going to get into, um, but... It does look like you've done a bit of focusing on kind of that idea of the divine and the icy devils and the whatnot. So there's a lot of that flavor in there. Mm -hmm. All right. And then um, we kind of left a lot of your equipment as is for now, although feel free to make some adjustments to that before we start our next game. But you do have some magic items in there as well. Right. And I got um, some more gold and stuff as well, you had said. Yes. Here, I can add it for you. Oh, okay. Look at me go. Yeah, yeah what, whatever whatever you want to do. Bloop. There, I did it. Cool. All right. Oh, yeah. There you go. So for those of you who are listening, um, especially if you're listening early because you're a patron, you will see this character sheet actually go up before this episode even goes live because this will be our weekly random character for this week. So that will go live on Wednesday August 15th. <laughs> That's right. You have a lot to finish up. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I got to finish this up. Um, and uh, so you guys will have a sneak peek of that. And then uh, let's see. This Friday is our last Call of Cthulhu episode. And then next Friday is this episode that you're listening to right now. So, yeah, that's uh, that's perfect. So you'll actually get the weekly random character version of this tiefling one week before the character creation episode goes live for patrons. Um, And if you're not listening to this early because you're not a patron, you could have listened to this almost a month before you're listening to it now. If you supported us on patreon.com slash just barbarian things. All right. Well, anything else that you want to say about your character? No, that's it. I need to come up with a, a good name for a male Levistus tiefling sorcerer who was uh, educated at a uh, university in Sharn. True. And so I just have a little work to do in terms of name and, you know, particulars of backstory, maybe. I don't know. Whatever, whatever you assign me, <laughs> Ms. Rainey. Sure thing. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening. We hope you guys enjoyed this character creation session, making a kind of random Eberron character. And uh, what you will see in the next few weeks is us playing through um, what I'm expecting will probably be another three-parter of uncovering and resolving a mystery in Sharn. Yeah. Hope you had a good time. Thanks for coming out. All right. Good night.